the first chapter here is general facts about how debugging works. And then we have another whole chapter about Ollie Debug, which is the main tool we're going to use. Ollie Debug is old, and the update destroyed it. So the new product is called Immunity Debugger, which bought the code of Ollie Debug and continued it. So it's probably more professional to use Immunity, but a bunch of people continue to use and love Ollie. They're very, very similar. Anyway, a disassembler we've been using. A disassembler is a static code analysis technique. It reads the binary, and it tries to turn it into assembly language so you can read it. And some disassemblers, like Hopper, will actually turn it further into pseudocode, which looks like C, although it's not accurate enough to compile as C. And the disassembler assembly language is not all that accurate either. It's actually guessing about quite a bit there, and it usually works pretty well for code that was written in a higher level language and compiled, but if you write your own assembly code, it is pretty easy to write assembly code that either cannot decompile. And we'll be covering that in a future chapter. But anyway, that's what a disassembler does. It just creates a static record of the code, which you then have to read and figure out. A debugger is a lot more cool. A debugger runs the code and lets you see everything as it runs, all the registers, um, every memory location, and even lets you stop it anywhere you want and modify it. And you can modify something and run it, and then go back and modify it differently and run it. You can even modify it and save a modified executable on the disk so you can use it to like cheat at Windows games and stuff. So that's the game here. Um, like I say, Ollie Debug is the most popular one for malware analysis and its later um, offspring called Immunity. WinDebug is the one Microsoft uses and it is the most tightly integrated with the Windows operating system so that it can debug the kernel of Windows. So it's a more powerful debugger, but it is very unpleasant to use. It has essentially no GUI at all. The only purpose of the GUI is to confuse you by opening up three or four windows into which you type command line commands. Um, I don't know why they bothered. It seemed to me like if they just decided to make it work like GDB, it probably would have been more clear. But anyway, it's, it's, it takes some practice. There's a learning curve with WinDebug more than Ollie, and we'll use them both here in very basic ways. So a source level debugger is what developers use. Where you actually, and you've been, if you've taken the exploit development class, we did this in the first couple projects where you would save the C code in the same directory, then run GD and compile with the minus G switch to save symbols. And then when you use GDB, you can actually see the C source code and put breakpoints on lines of source code. That's what a source level debugger does. And that's what you use if you're a developer. If you're writing your own software in a high level language, and you de its original purpose of a debugger is to help you find out why your code doesn't work. But, these low-level debuggers are what we're doing, which is reverse engineering. Now, that's forward engineering, where you write something, and then you want to find the errors in it and clean them up. But what we're doing is reverse engineering, where you get the finished product, and you have to figure out how it works without the help of the high-level code, which is, at first glance, impossible. And with practice, you can do it better and better, and that's really quite exciting. Reverse engineering hardware is a whole big area. This, as the Internet of Things comes out, this becomes more and more and more important. You are presented with more and more dangerous gadgets that you're supposed to connect to your network and you really would like to test it and see how unsafe it is and reverse engineering is pretty much your only choice. There is um, some legal issues here. It is technically illegal to reverse engineer something and then use that code in something else. That would be copyright violation and theft. And um, the other laws around reverse engineering, like everything else in this business, are kind of unclear. But anyway, um, I think any, nobody's going to sue you for reverse engineering malware because the stuff is evil in the first place and nobody can admit they wrote it. So anyway, uh, all right, so you, your assembly language debugger is going to take the executable malware and turn it into assembly language instructions and then run it in assembly language so you can see it. And that's the game. So if a Windows app crashes, it will pop up a crash box. This will be uh, the Windows operating system will say it crashed, and then it will give you an option to run it in a debugger. You can, de you can install a debugger and make it your default debugger, and that's what will open. Typically, it opens WinDebug if you have it installed. Um, all right. There used to be something called Dr. Watson. I think that's gone now, but that was the default debugger in the days of, like, Windows 95 and Windows 98. All right. Then, of course, there's kernel and user mode. Now, user mode is by far the most common. This is the main thing you do because normally you're dealing with code that runs in user land. The 
malware author wrote it in something like Visual Basic and compiled it like a normal program and it turned into an EXE and they somehow tricked somebody into running that EXE by attaching it to an email or having some kind of web exploit that downloaded and ran it as they thought they were viewing an ad or something. But then it's just user mode uh, debugging and that's the most common arrangement. <laughs> of course, user mode malware is not as powerful as kernel mode malware um, but and it runs in a separate process from the kernel, but it's the most common kind of malware. Kernel mode debugging is normally not something you do. Now, if you were actually writing a Windows device driver, is the main reason you would do this. You've made your own printer or a network card or something. You've made a device driver, and your device driver kills Windows with the blue screen of death, which is very common, and you have to figure out why. So now, you have to have two computers. This is the way Microsoft originally ran it. You have two computers connected with a serial cable with 25 pins, using a port that doesn't even exist on any computer made in the last 10 years. And then, one computer is slaved to the other. One computer is running in debug mode, which means it's sending signals through that serial cable, and the other computer is telling the kernel to go step by step. And now you run your buggy stuff over here and it crashes, and that over through the serial cable, it can suck down information to display on this good computer what happened to the crash. And you can then stop and break point and put all that jazz in the kernel. That was the original plan. Um, it's quite difficult to set up on modern machines. Um, one thing Microsoft added with Windows 8 was the ability to do this through modern connectors like Ethernet, but it doesn't work very well. And my students suffered greatly. And Mark Rasinovich, who is always a hero, came to our rescue with LiveKD. And what LiveKD does is you can do a memory dump from the kernel, and then you can look at the memory dump. So you can see what's in the kernel. Now, I don't believe this tool gives you all the features you get with the old two-cable, two-machine method. I don't think you can, like, put breakpoints in the kernel and stuff, but you can at least see the kernel. And that's LiveKD, and that's what we're going to do. So you install this LiveKD tool. Um, now, you do need to turn on debugging mode. In um, in the past, students did this in the Windows 10 machines natively in the lab. And that had two disadvantages. The first thing is, as we learned from previous semesters, Windows 10 is extremely unstable and extremely unreliable because Microsoft pushes down updates all the time and they break everything. And so projects that work don't work in two weeks. And the second thing is, if you turn on kernel mode debugging, then the print screen key is interpreted as the break key, and it causes the machine to die with a blue screen of death, which is kind of unpleasant for the students doing my other homework, where they work for an hour, get their final picture, and hit print screen, trying to save the picture, and pfft, everything's gone. So it turned out to be sort of uh, unfriendly to do this on the raw machines there, so I now I recommend using your virtual machine for this kernel debugging, and that's how I did it here. Um, I put it in your... Uh, Windows, I put it in your Windows 2008. It works fine in there. So anyway, um, and there's nice introduction to Ollie Bug. You might want to take a look at this. This is one of the things that motivated me to teach the exploit development course. The, because uh, Joe McCray, who is a great guy, has a nice introduction to Ollie Bug in this lecture that is not too baffling. Ollie Debug suffers from giving you far too much information. Anyway, we'll talk about it next time, but you might want to look at this video. It's a very friendly introduction to the tool, and it's what my lectures are most mostly based on. Anyway, so I got a few icebreaker questions. Grab one if you need one. But I really like Joe. I've been trying to recruit him to come here, but I'm not sure it's going to work. He's on the East Coast. But um, he's very good at taking bafflingly complicated things and explaining it in a simple way, which is the primary job here. So again, I hope none of you have the illusions that you're learning any of this stuff in depth. We're only learning a little bit about how to use these complicated tools in the most simple case, and each one of these tools certainly deserves a whole course, like Wind Debug and stuff. Um, but, <coughs> all right. but at least you can do a few simple things there after I'll be down here. So which one of these requires two computers connected together? Okay, they're all in. All right, and that's kernel mode debugging. For full kernel mode debugging, you need two computers connected together. 
all out. Which one is almost never used by a malware analyst? In. And the thing you never use is a source level debugger because the author would have to be kind enough to include the source code. There have been a couple viruses that actually had that, and everyone laughs at them because they, they turned in like the development version instead of the final version, but not too many people are dumb enough to do that. So, could be a show up mode too, right? What's that? Could be a show up mode too, right? It could be. And, and the thing I think that's another thing I mentioned is Android developers are not aware that they're always including a source code, I think because the Smalley is almost as readable as Java. So they need to have a different philosophy than people who write in C and imagine that people can't see the source code. Anyway, if you get a blue screen of death, how should you debug it? I'll wait for seven or 45, whichever comes first. All right, you got to debug it with kernel debugging. That's what the blue screen of death means. If you are in user land and you crash, it opens up that crash box and offers to let you see the debugger or restart the program because you don't kill the operating system. If you're in kernel land and you die, you're out of luck, then you get the blue screen of death. Then Windows is lost and you can't do anything. So you got to do kernel mode debugging is the only thing you can do then. And all device drivers have to run in kernel land which is a bad thing for Microsoft. I mean, the kernel land is super important, and they have to let all the manufacturers put code in there. And of course, the manufacturers with the lowest prices have the lowest quality code, which is then right in the kernel. And so Microsoft has worked harder and harder to sort of harass the developers and the users into not using unsigned drivers and paying a little more for their hardware to get better drivers to put in the kernel. And this is why well, I was surprised when I got Windows Server 2003 and I put it on a machine that had been running XP, and suddenly there were no drivers for the hardware. Because Microsoft requirements are much stricter for the server than the client. So the same hardware that had an XP driver did not have a Server 2003 driver. And if you copied over the XP driver and approved it, it would run. But Microsoft tried to discourage you from running a server on that cheap hardware. They wanted you to go pay for a server class hardware because they really don't want their help desk hearing all the complaints from you after you use crappy drivers. Anyway, so uh, you can start the program inside the debugger and launch it there, which is fine. It will load it into memory and then pause it before it executes any instructions, which is a little disorienting at first, but you get used to it. They figure you want to do something, like set breakpoints or something on it, so you don't want it to just run as soon as it loads. It's going to start, stop. The other thing you can do is if you want to debug something like a service that's already running, you can connect to it as it's already running. And then as soon as you connect, it will pause all the threads again, so that service will stop working, and you can examine its state, and then you can move forward and put in breakpoints and whatever you want to do to it. Um, you, one thing you can do, which is actually quite useful, I've learned to use it more and more in both Linux and Windows debugging, is to just go one step at a time. You did this in that Jasmine tool. It's not a bad thing, just step, 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 step. When I get frustrated, <laughs> I just do step, 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 step through the thing to find out what it's doing. When it, and that, that you can get there. Of course, you might have to do hundreds or thousands of steps to get to something interesting, and then you want to use faster techniques. But once you have something that's happening that you care about, like a crash, and you get close to it, one thing that often works is just step up to the crash. You can see what it's doing. Um, so here's, for example, is code um, that is decoding some string. So it's going down here. It's got a loop W, which is going to loop back to that location. It's XOR, and this is XOR encoding, so it's just simple XOR with 0x9c. So in that case, you can if you spot that, it's actually single byte XOR. You could just do it yourself in Python. But anyway, that could be something complicated. But whatever it is, if you step through it, you'll just see the plain text appearing here, and that's awesome. So once you get to an interesting spot, this is, this is especially useful. I mostly use this against like PHP malware. PHP malware is often obfuscated. And the best way to deobfuscate it is to comment out the second half 
figure out the deobfuscator, run that far and then stop. It will has to unpack itself to run, so you can stop it after it unpacks and before it runs. But again, you should always be doing it in a virtual machine. The last time I did that, I made a mistake and let in a few commands that actually did things get executed because I couldn't read them in their obfuscated form. So you should always work in a disposable virtual machine whenever you're analyzing malware. Even when you think you're being careful, it is very easy to accidentally run some of the malware functions. Anyway, um, all right. So there are two things here which I certainly had trouble understanding at first. They're stepping over and stepping in. So suppose I start my program and I'm up here at say name. And then I call some function like check password. And that calls some function like fscanf or, or, or let's say cn to get some input from the user and so on. So now if I'm up here in main, I've got code. And if I'm, I might want not even care about any subroutines, I just want to move line by line through main. Then I use step over. So I come to an instruction, which is a call to go down here. If I press F8, it will step over. And then we'll go down here, finish, and come back and go to the next instruction in main. This is step over. So I do not descend deeper into the structure of the code. I stay at my current level and go to the next line. That might be what you want. On the other hand, you might want to go into here and into here and find out what's going on. And that's what step in does. So there's two ways to make a step. One way is to make a step at my current level. Another way is to make this next instruction wherever it is, which is going to be the start of this routine. And then I'll step through here, and this routine will call that routine. If I keep stepping in, I'm going to eventually end up in C system routines and be debugging the C uh, libraries and the kernel and things like that which is probably not what I want to do. Unless you're really trying to win a bug bounty by finding holes in C, you probably don't want to do that. Can you pull that thing down a bit more? It's uh, shining in the eyes. Thank you. Uh, there's a yeah. chain somewhere. Yes. On one side or the other, there's a chain. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. Anyway, um, so that's the game. All right, then there's breakpoints. Uh, the way breakpoints work is kind of insane. They will go into the binary and replace the byte with CC. And remember, in the memory of OllyDebug, what should be there. So the instruction will run, it'll hit a CC, which is an int 3, and that will cause it to stop. Then when you continue, it will put that instruction back the way it should be and continue. So that's the game. That's how um, the most common breakpoint works. So if you have some kind of call, like here is an example, you move some value from the stack into ECX, then you move um, some pointer from somewhere in EAX, then you call it. So at this point, I don't know what is in EDX. I can't read the static code that I might get from Ida Pro and figure out what's going on here because the value in EDX depends on the instructions that went up here and I'm gonna jump to some location that was in a register. So it calculates the location and unless I'm gonna have to like do a lot of work to figure out where it's going here. What's a lot simpler is to put a, a breakpoint here before the call and let it run and then look to see what's in EDX and then I'll find out where it's going. That's the point of debuggers to let the program do the work for you instead of you having to understand everything. So this will calculate a file name and then create a file. So you, as always, you start on the right just looking for the functions. So up here's something called number of bytes written. Then here's some parameters to create a file. It's going to add a .txt and have some kind of stuff before it, and then it's gonna call create file. And all these things are pushed onto the stack, all these pushes are scattered throughout. So it did some kind of calculation, uh, figuring out what the file name was, and then put a .txt. And this is quite common. Malware often uses a pseudo-random mathematical technique to create the domain name for the command and control server, or the file name it stores on a disk. There's a lot of malware that makes a file on the disk but the name is random. You run it again, check another machine, it's different. So it's fairly common. So if you don't want to try to decompose all this nonsense, set a breakpoint down here when it's all ready to create the file, and now the stack will have the file name in plain text. So it's the same thing. All right, then there's WinDebug. Let me see if I can get this high clicker thing out of the way. I, we'd be better off to have two screens or something up here anyway. Um, all right. So you can set a breakpoint here, bp at create file w. This is what that would look like in all debug. And then g will run to the breakpoint. And when it hits the breakpoint, it will show you the registers. And it will show you, it's about to call this, and then you can dump 
um, ESP plus four, which is the value off the stack, and here it tells you log file dot text. So as you can see, the same information is here, essentially without the GUI. I don't know why they bother drawing these windows at all. Everything is, you have to do one of these commands just like you might in GDB. But it does have the same power as all debug. Yeah, all right. And another simple example is encrypted data. Yeah, malware, this is actually pretty handy. When I first, when you first start learning encryption, you learn all this miserable stuff that's thousands of years old, like the Caesar cipher, and you say, why am I even wasting my time on this nonsense? And the answer is malware. Malware often uses these old crappy encryption routines that are not really secure because it's so hard to read the assembly code anyway that making it even a little more complicated will wipe out a lot of analysts. So they often use really lame encryption. The other reason is real encryption requires libraries and they can totally get caught. You can see they're loading a library to do something like um, the recommended encryption routine from the government EAS or something, AES. So anyway, if you have some kind of encryption, you can um, set a breakpoint before it encrypts the data going out and get it. Now here's one way to do it. So there's a call there to encrypt data. So just put a breakpoint there and stop and look on the stack and you'll have plain text data that's about to be encrypted. That couldn't be nicer. And here's that happening in Ollie Debug. You just put a breakpoint there, that's why that's turned red. So now when you run it to that point, you'll see the stack here. And what they've done is put the stack down here in the hex dump so you can just see it and there it is, secret message. So that's handy. All right, so here's common types of breakpoints. Some programs implement more, and Ollie Debug in particular does implement another one it made up called a memory breakpoint, which is kind of insane. But these are the kind you almost always see. By far the most common is a software execution breakpoint, where you just choose a line of assembly code, and when it tries to execute that line, it will stop. That's the kind that happens by just putting a CC on top of it, so it stops. Hardware execution and conditional are useful but in special cases, but most of the time you just use these. So it's very simple. You just change one byte of the code and now run it as usual. It will automatically stop when it hits there with an interrupt three. Your debugger is often even written in Python. It's not a very complicated thing. It just picks up the int three and processes it by stopping and showing you the condition of the processor. Um, one issue is that the um, the debugger will now lie to you, right? If you look, if I put a breakpoint here and it stops, the debugger will tell me that that's 55. But it's not, it's actually CC, of course, because it broke. And if you take a look in the memory dump, you will see a CC. This means that a software execution breakpoint does modify the code. And if the code contains integrity checks, like signatures and MD5 sums, it might actually refuse to run, detecting that somebody is modifying the code. So sometimes you can't use these, but most of the time you can. It's just like analyzing malware in a virtual machine. You're fine unless the attacker thought of that, and they check and they realize you're in a virtual machine and behave differently because of that. So here's examples. Um, yeah, if memory tries, if, by the way, if uh, the code tries to copy those bytes somewhere else for some reason and mess with them, it's gonna get the wrong bytes. It's gonna get a CC instead of the right byte, and that might mess things up. So there's an alternative. There's hardware execution breakpoints. These are features in the processor. There are registers just for this reason, DR0 through DR3. You set these addresses, and then you can specify when you wanna break, when it tries to execute, when it tries to read or write to that location, it will stop. And this you can put in without changing any code bytes because your code is running, you've got the RAM, the text section, the data section and stuff, and then you've got the processors, and all that stuff is unchanged. There are extra uh, registers, I mean, there are extra special registers used just for this purpose. You set them in DR0 through DR3, and now you can have four breakpoints that the code shouldn't notice at all, unless it deliberately looks for them. Now the problem is, there are assembly language instructions to set these registers, of course. How else could you do it? So the code can check them. And the code can deliberately mess with them to stop debugging. That's one of the anti-debugging things. Now there is a flag in GR7 to detect attempts to change the contents, but it doesn't detect other instructions. So it only detects move into there. It doesn't detect things like increment and decrement and other things that might do it. So it's not perfect, but there is some defense against malicious attempts to modify these registers. 
I say nothing is ever perfect, and that's why you learn so many tools, even when they supposedly do the same thing, because frequency, one tool doesn't work and you have to try a different one to get the same job done. Conditional breakpoints are synthesized by the debugger software. They act just like software execution breakpoints, and it's really pretty simple. So suppose I want to break at a breakpoint, and then I only really want to break if like EAX is bigger than 100. So all you do is put in a software breakpoint, it breaks, so it stops running assembly language, it goes into your debugger, which is probably Python. In Python it says, is EAX greater than 100? If not, continue. So it will continue, every, it'll break every time you hit that instruction, but then it will just continue. The only problem is Python is really slow. So if you have to hit that point hundreds of times before you hit the condition, it'll run really slowly. But that's the painful here. As far as the um, assembly language is concerned, it's just got a normal software execution breakpoint. It's just got an automatic continue until that condition is passed. So this is a mixture of debugger code in Python and assembly language running through an interrupt. Anyway, that's the game there. So they take much longer than ordinary instructions, and it can slow down your program. If you put it in a place that's used too many times, your program will just freeze and never finish at all because it's taking hours to get through there. But, you know, as long as you're aware of the limitations, these things can be useful. I got a few more eye clickers. All right, what kind of breakpoint uses interrupt number three? Um, more than one, the software execution breakpoint and the conditional breakpoint, both used to interrupt three. The executable code does not know the difference. All right. What kind of breakpoint might make your program run slowly? All right. The only one with that property is the conditional breakpoint. The others will stop it, but only the conditional will let it proceed, but slowly. If it keeps on hitting your condition being false and having to go through slow Python steps to do that. All right, what's the most common type of breakpoint? All right, that's the first one, software execution. That's good enough for almost every case. You only use the others when you can't use this for some reason. All right. Which one might miss important functionality? All right. If you step over, then something might happen inside there that you care about. Obviously, you're you're skipping something. It's not that it doesn't execute the instructions, which is something I thought the first time I read the book. It executes all those instructions and comes back, but you didn't see any of that happen. You're single stepping to see something happen. And by the way, some malware is so evil, it will never come back. It will jump into subroutines and just quit. So it never comes back. So stepping over doesn't work. But anyway, proper codes ought to always come back. I don't know if you remember the movie Inception, the people in a dream and a dream or a dream and then they may not come back enough steps. It's polite to come all the way back. Otherwise, you leave junk for the operating system. All right, what type of breakpoint changes the binary code? again, more than one, the conditional breakpoint and the software execution breakpoint both work the same way. They both work by putting a CC on top of a byte. The only difference between them is what the Python does with it after that interrupt. But they both change the code. All right. What breakpoint uses the DR registers? Right. 
that is the hardware brake pumps. That's what they are there for. Built into the hardware. Very handy. All right. So I think I'll just do the last section here. So exceptions. Um, this is different than an interrupt. The point of an exception, the brake points generate exceptions, and you could so, so do errors, like divide by zero, invalid memory access, attempt to execute code without proper permissions. For example, attempt to execute kernel code when you're in user land, or attempt to execute code in a memory location marked non-execute. All these will cause exceptions, which means the program cannot continue to run because the next instruction is forbidden, and it then returns to the operating system, or it might be caught by your code. Now, you might want to catch exceptions rather than have your program crash and dump to the operating system's default. So there are first chance and second chance exceptions in debuggers. Um, the debugger gets the first chance at control. Every time there's an exception, the debugger can grab it because that's what debuggers normally do. All the breakpoints are exceptions, so the debugger tries to grab the exception. Now, if the debugger decides that this exception is not an interrupt that's my business, it will then pass it back and let the program try to catch it. Then the program ex has an exception handler, which might handle the exception, and if it doesn't, it will fall back to the operating system. So that's the second chance. The debugger gets a second chance to handle it, and uh, you usually ignore first chance exceptions. Second chance exceptions you can't ignore, because those mean the program cannot continue. Something is really wrong. And uh, the one common reason is that you're running in the wrong environments, you're running in the wrong version of Windows or something, or it's assuming some other library or something is installed that isn't there. So int3 is the most common one, of course. This is how you do single steps and breakpoints and everything in the debugger. Um, you can also set a trap flag in the flags register, and that will, that will do single steps. And it does it by replacing each sequential instruction by CC. Uh, then there are memory access violation exceptions. Um, this is like I say when you try to execute invalid memory. It happens a lot in our exploit development because you start by injecting letters and you eventually end up trying to execute code at some stupid place like 41, 41, 41, 41 because you put in a bunch of capital A's. So you're referring to memory locations that are outside the mappable space of that, um, of that code, the allocated space. That's a memory access violation. Then you see you can violate privilege rules, like you try to execute a kernel instruction, but you are not running in ring zero. That would do it. Um, and there is a nice list of exceptions up here if you want to see them. Here's the byte by zero, the single step debugging section, non maskable interrupt from the hardware, and so on. Here's the int three, and there are a lot of these. These are the various exceptions, different kinds of error conditions that are caused as certain bad things happen. So, the last thing is modifying execution with the debugger, and this semester I added a couple of uh, new projects to my other class, my exploit development class, where we actually make some script kitty type modifications at Windows binaries, which is kind of a good way to get started with this. So you might want to change the way it runs. For example, uh, change an instruction pointer. If it's about to do something you don't want, you can just move the instruction pointer down here and skip that code and do something else, like the product activation that asks you for a product key. You can just skip over that. You can also just fill it with NOPs, which amounts to the same thing, because then you can save the binary, and now you crack the game. Now you can play the game, and it won't ask you for the product key. All right. Um, you could also, so you can do that by putting in a breakpoint. Now, of course, if you do skip instructions and you're not very careful, those instructions do something. So like the registers, like the EAX and EBX, and when you try to continue, it's going to crash because you didn't really take into account everything those instructions were going to do. So you could also test a function, like you might find an interesting function, and you don't want to, and you can't figure out what runs it. So you just want to run the function itself without running the calling function, and you can do that. Um, however, that messes up the stack. You're not going to be able to resume execution of, of the normal program after that, but you can test a function. All right, and we'll do that next time. It's easy enough to do an ollie. Call up a function and run it, feed in some parameters, and see what it does. Um, all right, so here's some examples. Um, there was a real virus. Uh, this is quite common, that com uh, especially, for example, Russians. Russian hackers, I don't know if this is actually written down anywhere, but in practice it is abundantly clear that Putin loves his hackers, and he's perfectly happy with them hacking American companies for money. He encourages them, he protects them, but you aren't allowed to hack Russian companies. If you hack people inside Russia, they will arrest you. If you hack people outside Russia, you're a hero. So they often write malware that will not attack you if you're in Russia. 
So it will do something like read the language on the machine, and if it's in Russian, it won't attack it, or it or if it will only attack people in Russia instead. So anyway, here's the example. These guys found this was a Chinese virus, and if it finds out that you're using Chinese, it will not infect you. If it has English, it'll do something harmless. If it's Japanese or Indonesian, it will wipe out your hard drive. So these guys have targeted a certain group. And so um, you've got this thing here, get system defaults LCID. This is a Microsoft API call that gets you some information about what locale the machine is set for. Now Microsoft has its international editions, and you can tell it, I'm Japanese, I'm Indonesian, and it will change the, the font for the messages and the font for currency and all that. So you get, this is the call that gets that. Then it's going to do some kind of calculation. It's, it's going to, this is a, a switch state. It's going to compare it to 409, compare it to 411, compare it to 421, and do different things. And CO4 is Chinese. So if it's Chinese, it goes here, if it's Indonesian. So you can put a breakpoint there at one. Um, that's where it gets the information. And then instead of being stuck with the return value of your machine, or having to do something crazy like change your machine to Chinese to see the Chinese behavior, you can just change the result of this. Break it there and then change the result, which comes back in EAX to one of these values. You're going to cause the malware to interpret your machine as a Japanese machine and see what it does. All right. So we're down to the last eye clickers. All right. So which one of these handles exceptions during normal program execution? got your answers, but I'm not sure I know the right answer. I think it's first or second chance. Let's go back and take another look at that. The first chance happens when you're in a debugger. When you're not in a debugger, it's the second chance. Oh, if the application doesn't handle it. Hmm, I still don't understand this question. That's the second time it goes back to the debugger. So that doesn't seem logical at all. Um, during normal execution outside a debugger. Oh, oh now I'm with it. Okay, it's the SEH. Okay, if you're outside a debugger, you don't have this first or second chance, you have the SEH. That is where, that is where the programmer can put the exception handler they wrote. So now I feel happy. It's a cruel, it's not a popular answer, but it is the right answer. First and second chance are only in a debugger. If you want to write an error message that pops up with certain errors, you do it by, uh, by writing an SEH. And we'll be playing with it as you go ahead. It's also a good place to put exploit code. <coughs> or more correctly, pointers to exploit code. All right, which one does single stepping? Mm. Oh, okay. Mm. Um, I get some answers. I might not create this one. Now, you'd certainly do it with int3, but, oh, the trap flag. You do it with the trap flag. That creates single stepping, but it probably uses first and second chances, too. So I don't think I'm going to grade this one. The trap flag is considered the most direct answer to this. The trap flag is a special flag you can put in the processor where it will only execute one instruction at a time. But it's actually doing it by using int3, so I'm not, uh, not going to grade that one. And some of these matter. That's, that's not a very smart question. All right. Let's see if the others are any better. What type of exception does not stop code execution and can usually be ignored? That's a fair one. All right. And that's first chance. First chance that the debugger gets at it, it then just passes it back to the program to see if the program has an exception handler. And that's usually then the program handles it and everything's fine. Only if it comes back the second time does it mean something's really wrong and then the debugger has to take some kind of action. All right. Let me just delete this one so it doesn't give me a headache next year. All right, so. Um, all right. A ring three process tries to access hardware directly. What happens? All right, 
you get a privilege violation. You are not allowed to do that. All right. Uh, this, by the way, I must say, one of the cruelest examples of this is Linux, which just happened to a student in the lab today. If you have a 64-bit Linux machine and you try to run 32-bit executable, it says privilege violation, which I don't know why. <laughs> Linux doesn't support backward compatibility, so you can't run 32-bit code on a 64-bit processor unless you install a couple of libraries that aren't there by default, but it makes you think you need to be root or something with the error privilege uh, violation. Anyway. So that's it for that. I'll see who got the most right, and I'll go down to the lab and help anybody who wants to work. If you run out of fun things to do, do easy CTF. But anyway, that doesn't seem to be too much of a hit, although you don't know what you're missing. So this is 126, chapter 8, I think.